Book Talk begins at 6 minutes and 4 seconds. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 632, Poe Buddy's Nerfic. This episode of Craftlet is brought to us by our patrons over at patreon.com slash craftlet. This week, we are thanking specifically Terry J.R., Galen C., Lisa P., Susan S., and Amy W. Thank you all so much for your support. We really, really could not do this without you right now. Thank you. So hello! Today is going to be a little different from our normal normalness, partially because my brain is not what it has been in the past previously, and the holes that are in it are showing themselves. I will say this, though. I mentioned the Visible app. I think I mentioned it last week, but I also mentioned it in last week's In It for the Long Haul post over on Substack. I have the armband that you can do with the visible app so that it's constantly measuring your heart rate variability. It turns out this is a clue into how much is too much. And so trying to figure out how to pace yourself when you have anything that's similar to chronic fatigue syndrome, learning how to pace yourself is really important. The problem is it's really hard to tell when you have overpaced yourself until you crash. And the crash can sometimes be delayed by two or three days. So that makes it really hard to plan appropriately. Enter the Visible app, which does a lovely job of giving me a heads up and saying, hey, it's been two minutes with an elevated HRV heart rate variability number. You need to cool it. And it's interesting because that is not just an elevated heart rate. That is fine. If I go for a walk and my heart rate goes up, that's fine as long as my heart rate is constant. Isn't that interesting? So I am hoping that by having more data that I can work with, it will allow me to get my brain back some But in the meantime, you know, we do what we can. And that's why this episode's going to be a little different. First, though, before we go any further, I do want to play a voicemail that we got from Anne Blanton about Athos and his response to taking the the spoils of the fight that they had with the Englishman. Here's Anne. Hello, Heather. This is Anne, A.T. Blanton. Yada, yada. You know me. Anyway, I was just listening to this most recent episode of Craftlet, We Wear the Mask, and you mentioned the uh, division of spoils after a duel. Now, I don't know so much about that, very little, but I wonder whether it is a holdover, I guess that's the word, from the medieval joust in which to the winner went the spoils. In a, in a joust, if you when you defeated your uh, companion in a one-on-one sort of combat, not the stylized jousts necessarily, the winner took the arms, armor, and horse of the uh, defeated one. So didn't matter whether they lived or died. Arms, armor, and horse lost them. Being a knight was very expensive. So anyway, that's all I know. I hope Jennifer B. enjoys the books, and we'll talk at you another time. Hasta la vista, baby. Bye. I am sure that you are correct, Anne. And the more I think about it, the more I wonder, because Dumas is writing about a time that's old even for him, 
he's well away from Louis the Thirteenth and his era. He's publishing this in 1844. It makes me wonder if some of Athos's attitude is Dumas going back and using capital R romantic, you know, like the French epic of Roland and Charlemagne and all of these heroic, larger-than-life characters who were well-placed and important and had a sense of noblesse oblige with them, if that's part of what Dumas is trying to get across with Athos's personality. Athos is probably the most complicated character and is going to continue to be and become even more so the most complicated character in Three Musketeers, which is probably why I really like him. Not just because I see Oliver Reed <laughs> in my mind every time I think of him. That's, that doesn't hurt, but just saying. Okay, today I was going to do two chapters. I was going to do chapter 33 and 34, and then because 33 was causing me such consternation, I decided to stop there. And then I have a special guest commentator after chapter 33. Just to give you a little bit of context, at the end of the last episode, we'd done a D'Artagnan chapter and then a Porthos chapter, and now we're doing another D'Artagnan chapter. So this is D'Artagnan, Kitty, and Milady again. We are going to be working with this triangle for a while. Kitty still has a crush on D'Artagnan. Don't forget the Comte de Ward was the hot young guy who D'Artagnan stabbed, who survived. We're about eight days away from the siege of La Rochelle, which we will get into when we get there. And one of the things that both kids, Aaron and Aiden, 23 and 19, have brought up is that within their world of book readers and online essayists, one of the things that's getting discussed more and more is that since the 1990s, we have been putting an awful lot of pressure onto our protagonists to be more or less perfect people. It is rare that we have a protagonist who is really complicated. We often give them a flaw, but we don't let them be particularly rough around any other edges. And I thought that was an interesting thing for them to have brought up right before this chapter. If you find issues with consent upsetting, our chapter today and the post-chapter conversation might be a little much for you. It's certainly not something I would play in front of small children. At the same time, I think it's important to, just like with the tenant of Wildfell Hall, have these conversations at some point with older children so that they don't get stuck in unhappy, unpleasant, and unsafe situations. But that said, I just wanted to give a heads-up trigger warning so that you were forearmed. So I'm going to play the chapter for you. Here we go with chapter 33 of the Three Musketeers, written by Alexandre Dumas. If you are listening to a different version than the one we have here, please skip ahead to 30 minutes and four seconds. And here we go. Chapter 33 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Soubrette and Mistress Meantime, as we have said, despite the cries of his conscience and the wise counsels of Athos, D'Artagnan became hourly more in love with Milady. Thus he never failed to pay his diurnal court to her, and the self-satisfied Gascon was convinced that sooner or later she could not fail to respond. One day, when he arrived with his head in the air and as light at heart as a man who awaits a shower of gold, he found the soubrette under the gateway of the hotel. But this time the pretty kitty was not contented with touching him as he passed. She took him gently by the hand. Good, thought D'Artagnan. She is charged with some message for me from her mistress. She is about to appoint some rendezvous of which she had not courage to speak. 
and he looked down at the pretty girl with the most triumphant air imaginable. "'I wish to say three words to you, Monsieur Chevalier,' stammered the soubrette. "'Speak, my child, speak,' said D'Artagnan. "'I listen.' "'Here? Impossible! That which I had to say is too long, and above all too secret.' "'Well, what is to be done?' "'If Monsieur Chevalier would follow me,' said Kitty timidly. "'Where you please, my dear child.' "'Come, then.' And Kitty, who had not let go the hand of D'Artagnan, led him up a little dark, winding staircase, and after ascending about fifteen steps, opened a door. "'Come in here, Monsieur Chevalier,' said she. "'Here we shall be alone and can talk.' "'And whose room is this, my dear child?' "'It is mine, Monsieur Chevalier. "'It communicates with my mistresses by that door. "'But you need not fear. "'She will not hear what we say. "'She never goes to bed before midnight.' "'D'Artagnan cast a glance around him. "'The little apartment was charming for its taste and neatness, "'but in spite of himself his eyes were directed to that door "'which Kitty said led to Milady's chamber. "'Kitty guessed what was passing in the mind of the young man "'and heaved a deep sigh.' "'You love my mistress, then, very dearly, Monsieur Chevalier,' said she. "'Oh, more than I can say, Kitty. I am mad for her.' Kitty breathed a second sigh. "'Alas, Monsieur,' said she, "'that is too bad.' "'What the devil do you see so bad in it?' said D'Artagnan. "'Because, Monsieur,' replied Kitty, "'My mistress loves you not at all.' "'Hein,' said D'Artagnan, "'can she have charged you to tell me so?' "'Oh, no, monsieur, but out of the regard I have for you, "'I have taken the resolution to tell you so.' "'Much obliged, my dear Kitty, but for the intention only, "'for the information, you must agree, is not likely to be at all agreeable.' That is to say, you don't believe what I have told you. Is it not so? We have always some difficulty in believing such things, my pretty dear, were it only from self-love. Then you don't believe me? I confess that unless you deign to give me some proof of what you advance... What do you think of this? Kitty drew a little note from her bosom. For me? said D'Artagnan, seizing the letter. No, for another. For another? Yes. His name, his name, cried D'Artagnan. Read the address. Monsieur El Comte de Ward. The remembrance of the scene at St. Germain presented itself to the mind of the presumptuous Gascon, as quick as thought, he tore open the letter in spite of the cry which Kitty uttered on seeing what he was going to do, or, rather, what he was doing. "'Oh, good Lord, Monsieur Chevalier,' said she, "'what are you doing?' "'I,' said D'Artagnan, "'nothing.' And he read, "'You have not answered my first note. Are you indisposed, or have you forgotten the glances you favored me with at the ball of Madame de Guise?' You have an opportunity now, Count. Do not allow it to escape. D'Artagnan became very pale. He was wounded in his self-love. He thought that it was in his love. Poor dear Monsieur D'Artagnan, said Kitty in a voice full of compassion and pressing anew the young man's hand. You pity me, little one, said D'Artagnan. Oh, yes, and with all my heart— for I know what it is to be in love. You know what it is to be in love, said D'Artagnan, looking at her for the first time with much attention. Alas, yes. Well, then, instead of pitying me, you would do much better to assist me in avenging myself on your mistress. And what sort of revenge would you take? I would triumph over her and supplant my rival. "'I will never help you in that, Monsieur Chevalier,' said Kitty warmly. "'And why not?' demanded D'Artagnan. "'For two reasons.' 
What ones? The first is that my mistress will never love you. How do you know that? You have cut her to the heart. I? In what can I have offended her? I, who ever since I have known her, have lived at her feet like a slave. Speak, I beg you. I will never confess that but to the man who should read to the bottom of my soul. D'Artagnan looked at Kitty for the second time. The young girl had freshness and beauty which many duchesses would have purchased with their coronets. Kitty, said he, I will read to the bottom of your soul whenever you like. Don't let that disturb you. And he gave her a kiss at which the poor girl became as red as a cherry. Oh, no, said Kitty. It is not me you love. It is my mistress you love. You told me so just now. And does that hinder you from letting me know the second reason? The second reason, Monsieur le Chevalier, replied Kitty, emboldened by the kiss in the first place, and still further by the expression of the eyes of the young man, is that in love, every one for herself. Then only D'Artagnan remembered the languishing glances of Kitty, her constantly meeting him in the antechamber, the corridor, or on the stairs, those touches of the hand every time she met him, and her deep sighs. But absorbed by his desire to please the great lady, he had disdained the soubrette. He whose game is the eagle takes no heed of the sparrow. But this time our Gascon saw at a glance all the advantage to be derived from the love which Kitty had just confessed so innocently or so boldly. The interception of letters addressed to the Comte de Ward, news on the spot, entrance at all hours into Kitty's chamber, which was contiguous to her mistress's. The perfidious deceiver was, as may plainly be perceived, already sacrificing in intention the poor girl in order to obtain milady willy-nilly. Well, said he to the young girl, are you willing, my dear Kitty, that I should give you a proof of that love which you doubt? What love? asked the young girl. Of that which I am ready to feel toward you. And what is that proof? Are you willing that I should this evening pass with you the time I generally spend with your mistress? Oh, yes, said Kitty, clasping her hands. Very willing. Well, then, come here, my dear, said D'Artagnan, establishing himself in an easy chair. Come, and let me tell you that you are the prettiest soubrette I ever saw. And he did tell her so much, and so well, that the poor girl who asked nothing better than to believe him did believe him. Nevertheless, to D'Artagnan's great astonishment, the pretty Kitty defended herself resolutely. Time passes quickly when it is passed in attacks and defenses. Midnight sounded, and almost at the same time the bell was rung in Milady's chamber. "'Good God!' cried Kitty. "'There is my mistress calling me. Go, go directly!' D'Artagnan rose, took his hat, as if it had been his intention to obey, then opening quickly the door of a large closet, instead of that leading to the staircase, he buried himself amid the robes and dressing gowns of Milady. "'What are you doing?' cried Kitty. D'Artagnan, who had secured the key, shut himself up in the closet without reply. "'Well,' cried Milady in a sharp voice, "'are you asleep, that you don't answer when I ring?' And D'Artagnan heard the door of communication opened violently. "'Here I am, milady, here I am,' cried Kitty, springing forward to meet her mistress. Both went into the bedroom, and as the door of communication remained open, D'Artagnan could hear milady for some time scolding her maid. She was at length appeased, and the conversation turned upon him, while Kitty was assisting her mistress. "'Well,' said milady, "'I have not seen our Gascon this evening.' "'What, milady, has he not come?' said Kitty. "'Can he be inconstant before being happy?' "'Oh, no, he must have been prevented by Monsieur de Treville or Monsieur de Sassart. "'I understand my game, Kitty. I have this one safe.' "'What will you do with him, madame?' "'What will I do with him? Be easy, Kitty. "'There is something between that man and me that he is quite ignorant of.' He nearly made me lose my credit with his eminence. Oh, 
I will be revenged. I believed that Madame loved him. I love him? I detest him, an idiot who held the life of Lord de Winter in his hands and did not kill him, by which I missed three hundred thousand livre income. That's true, said Kitty. Your son was the only heir of his uncle, and until his majority you would have had the enjoyment of his fortune. D'Artagnan shuddered to the marrow at hearing this suave creature reproach him with that sharp voice which she took such pains to conceal in conversation, for not having killed a man whom he had seen load her with kindnesses. "'For all this,' continued Milady, "'I should long ago have revenged myself on him if, and I don't know why, the cardinal had not requested me to conciliate him.' "'Oh, yes, but madame has not conciliated that little woman he was so fond of.' "'What? The mercer's wife of the Rue de Fossoyeur?' "'Has he not already forgotten she ever existed? "'Fine vengeance, that, on my faith!' "'A cold sweat broke from D'Artagnan's brow. "'Why, this woman was a monster. "'He resumed his listening, but unfortunately the toilet was finished. "'That will do,' said Milady. "'Go into your room, and tomorrow endeavor again to get me an answer to the letter I gave you.' "'For Monsieur de Ward,' said Kitty, to be sure, for Monsieur de Ward. Now there is one, said Kitty, who appears to me quite a different sort of a man from that poor Monsieur d'Artagnan. Go to bed, mademoiselle, said Milady. I don't like comments. D'Artagnan heard the door close, then the noise of two bolts by which Milady fastened herself in. On her side, but as softly as possible, Kitty turned the key of the lock, and then D'Artagnan opened the closet door. "'Oh, good Lord!' said Kitty in a low voice. "'What is the matter with you? How pale you are!' "'The abominable creature!' murmured D'Artagnan. "'Silence! Silence! Be gone!' said Kitty. "'There is nothing but a wainscot between my chamber and Milady's. Every word that is uttered in one can be heard in the other.' "'That's exactly the reason I won't go,' said D'Artagnan. "'What?' said Kitty, blushing. "'Or at least I will go. Later.' He drew Kitty to him. She had the less motive to resist. Resistance would make so much noise. Therefore Kitty surrendered. It was a movement of vengeance upon Milady. D'Artagnan believed it right to say that vengeance is the pleasure of the gods. With a little more heart— he might have been contented with this new conquest, but the principal features of his character were ambition and pride. It must, however, be confessed in his justification that the first use be made of his influence over Kitty was to try and find out what had become of Madame Bonacieux. But the poor girl swore upon the crucifix to D'Artagnan that she was entirely ignorant on that head, her mistress never admitting her into half her secrets. Only she believed she could say she was not dead." As to the cause which was near making Milady lose her credit with the cardinal, Kitty knew nothing about it, but this time D'Artagnan was better informed than she was. As he had seen Milady on board a vessel at the moment he was leaving England, he suspected that it was, almost without a doubt, on account of the diamond studs. But what was clearest in all this was that the true hatred, the profound hatred, the inveterate hatred of Milady was increased by his not having killed her brother-in-law. D'Artagnan came the next day to Milady's, and finding her in a very ill humor, had no doubt that it was lack of an answer from Monsieur de Ward that provoked her thus. Kitty came in, but Milady was very cross with her. The poor girl ventured a glance at D'Artagnan, which said, "'See how I suffer on your account.' Toward the end of the evening, however, the beautiful lioness became milder. She smilingly listened to the soft speeches of D'Artagnan, and even gave him her hand to kiss. D'Artagnan departed, scarcely knowing what to think, but as he was a youth who did not easily lose his head, while continuing to pay his court to Milady, he had framed a little plan in his mind. He found Kitty at the gate, and as on the preceding evening went up to her chamber, Kitty had been accused of negligence and severely scolded. 
Milady could not at all comprehend the silence of the Comte de Ward, and she ordered Kitty to come at nine o'clock in the morning to take a third letter. D'Artagnan made Kitty promise to bring him that letter on the following morning. The poor girl promised all her lover desired. She was mad. Things passed as on the night before. D'Artagnan concealed himself in his closet. Milady called, undressed, sent away Kitty, and shut the door. As the night before, D'Artagnan did not return home till five o'clock in the morning. At eleven o'clock, Kitty came to him. She held in her hand a fresh billet from Milady. This time, the poor girl did not even argue with D'Artagnan. She gave it to him at once. She belonged body and soul to her handsome soldier. D'Artagnan opened the letter and read as follows. This is the third time I have written to tell you that I love you. Beware that I do not write to you a fourth time to tell you that I detest you. If you repent of the manner in which you have acted towards me, the young girl who brings you this will tell you how a man of spirit may obtain his pardon. D'Artagnan colored and grew pale several times in reading this billet. Oh, you love her still said Kitty, who had not taken her eyes off the young man's countenance for an instant. "'No, Kitty, you are mistaken. I do not love her, but I will avenge myself for her contempt.' "'Oh, yes, I know what sort of vengeance. You told me that.' "'What matters it to you, Kitty? You know it is you alone whom I love.' "'How can I know that?' "'By the scorn I will throw upon her.' D'Artagnan took a pen and wrote, "'Madame, until the present moment I could not believe that it was to me your first two letters were addressed. So unworthy did I feel myself of such an honor. Besides, I was so seriously indisposed that I could not in any case have replied to them. But now I am forced to believe in the excess of your kindness, since not only your letter but your servant assures me that I have the good fortune to be beloved by you.' She has no occasion to teach me the way in which a man of spirit may obtain his pardon. I will come and ask mine at eleven o'clock this evening. To delay it a single day would be in my eyes now to commit a fresh offense. From him who you have rendered the happiest of men, Comte de Ward. This note was, in the first place, a forgery. It was likewise an indelicacy. It was even, according to our present manners, something like an infamous action— but at that period people did not manage affairs as they do today. Besides, D'Artagnan, from her own admission, knew Milady culpable of treachery in matters more important, and could entertain no respect for her. And yet, notwithstanding this want of respect, he felt an uncontrollable passion for this woman boiling in his veins, passion drunk with contempt, but passion or thirst as the reader pleases. D'Artagnan's plan was very simple. By Kitty's chamber he could gain that of her mistress. He would take advantage of the first moment of surprise, shame, and terror to triumph over her. He might fail, but something must be left to chance. In eight days the campaign would open, and he would be compelled to leave Paris. D'Artagnan had no time for a prolonged love siege. There, said the young man, handing Kitty the letter sealed. Give that to Milady. It is the Count's reply. Poor Kitty became as pale as death. She suspected what the letter contained. "'Listen, my dear girl,' said D'Artagnan. "'You cannot but perceive that all this must end, some way or other. Milady may discover that you gave the first billet to my lackey instead of to the Count's, that it is I who have opened the others which ought to have been opened by de Ward. Milady will then turn you out of doors, and you know she is not the woman to limit her vengeance.' Alas, said Kitty, for whom have I exposed myself to all that? For me, I well know my sweet girl, said D'Artagnan, but I am grateful, I swear to you. But what does this note contain? Milady will tell you. Ah, oh, you do not love me, cried Kitty, and I am very wretched. To this reproach, there is always one response which deludes women, D'Artagnan replied in such a manner that Kitty remained in her great delusion. Although she cried freely before deciding to transmit the letter to her mistress, she did at last so decide, which was all D'Artagnan wished. Finally, 
He promised that he would leave her mistress's presence at an early hour that evening, and that when he left the mistress he would ascend with the maid. This promise completed poor Kitty's consolation. End of chapter 33 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia All right, so before I get to the complicated stuff, we do have a few things that go by really quickly in this chapter that we need to make sure we are well aware of. We find out that Milady hates D'Artagnan because he did not kill Lord de Winter. We find out that Milady has a son and that if de Winter had died, all of the estate would have gone to her son, who is not yet at his age majority. So Milady would have had free reign with all of the money and the estate. That she almost lost her credit with the cardinal over D'Artagnan, and she is not sure why. And we know now for certain that Milady had something to do with the kidnapping of Constance Bonancieux. She is ruthless. She is heartless. She is definitely ambitious. And I find it interesting that she is just a luscious villain. I mean, Faye Dunaway was really excellent casting for her in the 1974 version of The Three Musketeers. Because Faye Dunaway is a luscious kind of beauty. You know, the high cheekbones and the regal appearance. I mean, seeing her in a hairpin-based catfight is really a lot of fun. Because you don't often get to see something like that play out in a movie or in a story. That said, she's really horrible. <laughs> She's just doing horrible things to people. Ugh. So there's that about Milady. There is Kitty. I thought it was very interesting that in the Victorian version of the text, Kitty says, in love, it's everyone for herself. In the modern version of the text, she says, it's every man for himself, which I found to be a very odd interpolation. I would have expected the herself to be more modern. And I just found over on Substack a gentleman who is currently retranslating all of the Three Musketeers books, because the four of them actually show up in several books, including The Man in the Iron Mask. So it's this labor of love. He's been redoing it. He's been translating them serialized a chapter at a time and then posting them on Substack. I just found this. I have not had time to go back and look this particular line up, but I would be fascinated to see how he translates this one line because Kitty has a lot more character to her than I would have anticipated for a part in a story like hers. You know, she seems to have an actual fully formed character. She has needs and wants, and she's pretty clear about things. She has a job. She is a working girl. She is not stupid. But she has a crush on D'Artagnan, who I think Aaron described as the chattiest Chad that you're going to see for a while. <laughs> Which, yeah, I think so. And Dumas is not hiding that fact either, that he's all about ambition. This is actually, I'm reading to you from the new translation, after he drew Kitty towards him, and there was no way to resist, resistance makes so much noise, and so Kitty yielded. This was an impulse of vengeance on Milady. D'Artagnan found it was right to say that vengeance is the pleasure of the gods, and so, with a little heart, he would have been content with his new conquest. But D'Artagnan only had his ambition and his pride. That is not a nice thing to say about your protagonist. He does go on then and say, however, it must be said in praise of him, the first use he made of his influence over Kitty was to try to find out from her what had become of Madame Bonancieux, but the poor girl swore to D'Artagnan on a crucifix that she had no idea that her mistress never let her into more than half of her secrets, only she believed she could guarantee that Constance was not dead. This is not the first time or the last time that Dumas is going to make some kind of an apology or a point of reference regarding D'Artagnan. We're going to see more of this. And in fact, 
in later chapters, we're going to see Dumas more than once say, we can't really judge D'Artagnan based on the morals of our current day. He's functioning under a different set of public ethics and morality at the time. We can look on what he's doing and be critical of it. And I find that very interesting because, of course, us today in our modern world look on especially that scene that I just pulled from, and we are and should be rather critical of D'Artagnan's behavior. Last week over on Discord, JK left a message that I thought was perfectly timed, and I asked if I could read it to you, and so I'm going to read this message. It all has to do with what we're talking about right now. So here we go. Hi, Heather and everyone. I just listened to episode 630 and I have to say I am not feeling the love for this book. Young men doing stupid young men things, fighting, gambling, being vain about their importance in the world. Chapter 29 was particularly triggering, although that's probably too strong a word, but I have been on the receiving end of ridiculous lies from good looking young men. I had trouble seeing the humor in how Porthos was playing that woman, who was supposed to be a little over the hill, silly, and playing her own little game with her own husband. But as you've pointed out in so many previous books, Heather, women had to be canny about marrying, since that was their only means of livelihood. It does seem that Madame Coquinard does at least have a prenuptial agreement, unlike so many other heroines of our acquaintance. Just to say, I will go anywhere literarily with you, Heather. So I'm hanging in there. And also to say, with the issuing of the Ms. Magazine 50th anniversary volume, I saw the old cover, which has a man saying, do you know the women's movement has no sense of humor? And the woman saying, no, but hum a few bars and I'll fake it. So thank you, JK, for your message on Discord. And I, I wrote back and said, I feel you. And I almost didn't do the book because of it. But Dumas writes such good, feisty, smart women, I was finally talked into it. Just like the Bible, the Tenant of Wildfell Hall, the Yellow Wallpaper, etc., 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 I do like being able to gauge just how far we've come. And I really like the number of men who also find the boys will be boys garbage quite troubling. But yeah, I feel you. Because of this interchange, and because of things that I was feeling on my own, and also because I knew that this chapter today and another chapter later were on their way, we were going to have to deal with this head on at some point. I decided to go and talk to the kids because they have very interesting perspectives on all of these things. They were raised to be and have become really interesting, caring, thoughtful young people. And I always really appreciate getting their two cents because they've grown up in such a different world. And because they weren't raised in a be a good girl box, but because they were raised in a world where the be a good girl box was clearly a liability for women, they have interesting perspectives. So I sat down with Aiden. I I literally lying in bed because that was all I could do. Lying in bed, talking to Aiden, and I finally said, this is ridiculous. I'm going to record this. So what you are going to hear is kind of a freewheeling conversation. I imagine that you will be, ah, yes, Ing, just as often as you will be, what? Are you kidding, Ing? Throughout. But that seems right to me somehow. The sexual politics of the world that we are emerging into in a post-Me Too world are complicated. And I find the people who refuse to own their mistakes just as frustrating as the people who won't allow for someone's growth. I like to believe that people can learn to be better And I want to give them the benefit of the doubt until I'm proven wrong. At the same time, sticking my head in the sand and saying, there's no problem with this book or these characters is 
just not correct. (laughs) There are plenty of problems, but how nice that they can be recognized as problems nowadays. So here we go. I am going to play my conversation with Thing 2, who is now 19, and let you have at it. I cannot wait to hear your responses. I know not everyone is listening in real time. So if you have responses and you know you're well past the date that this came out, please still do not hesitate to send in your thoughts, 206-350-1642, or SpeakPipe, or you can go to linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlet channel, and you can get SpeakPipe from there. You can get the phone number from there. You can get the phone number on the app. I think you can just tap a button and it'll call from the app. Or you can email from within the app or email heather at craftlit.com or eric, E-R-I-K at craftlit.com or jemuel, J-E-M-U-E-L at craftlit.com. And one way or another, your comments will get to us and we will be able to compile them and probably have, uh, if we get enough comments, we'll have uh, an extra episode of just people conversating. And maybe if we get enough people to subscribe at YouTube, we can do a YouTube live stream where there's a conversation that can be had, where we can do a live Q&A chat and have more than one person on camera just so you know. And if not there, then we can try and figure out another way to do it and then share it out on YouTube. It just won't be live if we do it within Discord. And I'm just kind of making stuff up as I go right now. Either way, it's important. It's complicated. Here's what Aiden and I were talking about. Okay, so Kitty is into D'Artagnan. Yeah, no, deeply so. So Kitty is into D'Artagnan. Kitty's the one who's been brushing up against him. Rubbing elbows. <clears throat> rubbing glances elbows. Glances across the hall. Batting the eyes. Playing attack and defense, <laughs> but having a good time doing it. Yeah. So the problem here All is... All things we love and support. For sure. And, you know, go good, good for you. Get that trash man. He is such a trash. He's, he's trash. So He's a little trash can. He's a little trash can. You're short. Trash can. He's not short. I'm choosing to believe this man is five foot three. Okay. So, in my view, today view, yeah, he is using her. Yeah, no, absolutely. To get at Milady and also to find Constance, and which is kind of tacky because probably just because he wants sex. Sure, although he doesn't seem. This is the weird thing. In this he scene, doesn't it doesn't seem unhappy. Yeah, when it's just fooling around. Exactly, but it also it's just like in this scene, there is no reason for him to sleep with Kitty. No, you're right. Other than he's, he's pissed at pro- he's pissed, pissed at Milady. But I'm sorry, you know, I have been raised as a man. I'm not currently, but <laughs> there has never been a moment where I'm pissed off and I'm like, I'm so <laughs> pissed. I have to have sh- immediately. <laughs> that is never. Not a day has gone by where that thought has crossed my mind. Well, that's I, a weird choice. I guess I did something right. <laughs> <laughs> Either you did something right. I mean, it's. I guess it's like working out. But he could also have just worked out or killed someone. This guy kills so many people. He could have just bump into he, another rich guy. He doesn't actually. He's, no, he he's, kills. He everyone. kills. He has killed some people. But but my point is, he could have also done a duel. So here's my other question. Though. So I think he just is. You well, know, it's in the middle of the night. Sleepy little duelist well, with sleepy little ways. I think he is a sleepy little <laughs> with little ways. But <laughs> but here's the thing. Yeah. This is not a British or American novel. No. Wait, oh yeah, it's French. Which means the whole Puritan aspect of at least what I was raised with as as far as sex goes is not at play. Which we love. In this book. Sorry, Puritans. A little boring. Well, it's not just a little boring. It's also like it removes any agency that women might have about the the little they had at the time. Yeah, whatever pleasure you can find. But also, of course, there's also always the risk of pregnancy, which is serious and has massive repercussions. Kitty and Constance are not wilting violets. No. They are not 
little shrinking, terrified things. I mean, I don't know about Constance. Well, Constance literally tells her husband, you are an ass and a fool. I mean, she's like, has none of it from Okay, that's good. So she is, she totally knows how to advocate for herself. I love that. I do too. I I actually do. I know. I know I said that in my sarcastic And and even Kitty fights back. She doesn't just sit there and go, oh. I guess you can just, do. And she's like, no, she's going to hear you. She's yeah. going to kill you. I do also love that Kitty's no isn't a no to him. It's just like, don't be stupid about it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. This is entirely audible. So that's the problem. That's the problem. And it's quieter for me to just do what we both want to do anyway. <sighs> Whatever, man. So my <laughs> feeling bad about this whole thing is because yeah. I know that he doesn't really love her. Yeah. And she does really love him. For some reason. So it's not really... Well, he's hot. So it's not really the fact of the sex as it is the using. Yeah, of course. So that's the thing that's bugging me. But that also goes along with what Dumas says, that it's it's his ambition. He is a self-involved... Is it Dumas or is it Dumas? Dumas. Okay. He's I've been saying Dumas this whole time. 23-year-old who... 20-something, yeah. Who... Well, one... Thinks he's all that... And he's a Gascon. One, seeing as I'm like, what, four years younger than him? Basically at the same age. Yeah, I see it. But also, I mean, Dumas literally states in the text at this exact scene that's like, yeah, he was using her. He had a goal he needed. I don't remember. I know you just read it to me, but I don't remember. That's fine. <laughs> but basically he was saying, it's like, yeah, this was a morally bad decision made by a morally bad person. Yeah. There's no sugarcoating it. He was just like, and he was using her. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, and you, you and your brother made an interesting point yesterday. As always. That was, and I'm going to say it wrong because my brain yeah. is not what it was once. Uh-huh. You guys said something about the fact that it seemed to you that it's only been That's in recent era, recent ages, that we expect our protagonists to be good from the capital 90s G, and up. from the 90s and up to be good capital G good people yeah who are basically flawless right. or they Star have Wars. a flaw and it's usually a really dumb flaw often like ray from star wars i love her but she did not have any flaws and i'm boring exactly what about katniss katniss is a great character katniss is a huge girl failure in so many ways. And I don't mean that as a failure of, of, of being, being a girl. A girl. No, it's I... just, no, she's a girl and a failure in so many ways. No, it's true. She's a wreck. And I love that. I love messy characters, especially messy women. It's like, so, it's the same thing where it's just like, girl with sword. Great aesthetic. So this, okay, this is interesting because I don't know why. Okay. But now the person who pops into my mind as another girl failure. <laughs> yeah. In, in, it's, those it's defi- one of the in that new, definition. One of the new slangs I've been seeing on Tumblr. I like this. Along with people just going like, I'm doing girl math. <laughs> or I'm having girl dinner. Oh, I do. I totally am girl dinner. Well, because woman dinner apparently sounds a lot sadder. It sounds so sad, but girl dinner, I'm all over. Grammy and I both. So, Great. Scarlett O'Hara. Scarlett O'Hara. What's that? Scarlett O'Hara is the fiddle dee dee, and I'll think about it tomorrow, and Gone with the Wind, the... You should have said the words Gone with the Wind, (laughs) because she's from Gone with the Wind. God. Most people listening will know who Scarlett O'Hara is. Yeah, but I didn't. I was asking you for Uh, me. I thought you remember. I don't care about these people who give me money. Oh, my God. And send me books on Shakespeare. You can say thank you, They could live today or die tomorrow. Oh, my God. You're (laughs) such a punk. You have to cut that out. They're not going to know that it was sarcastic. Oh, my God. Thank so, you, by the way. I Scar- still love that book. Scarlett O'Hara. Tara Worcester. Tara? Oh, that was Tara. That was Tara. She follows me on Instagram. I know. And she made me my squid, Brunhilda. Yes. Love Brunhilda. So, <laughs> so Scarlett O'Hara yeah. is such, such a, a bad, bad person. person and such a bad example that, such a that I remember growing up I hearing that no one named their daughters Katie. In the South, because Katie Scarlet was such a horrible, horrible burden to put on a girl. I don't know if that was true or not. But, no, that sounds right. But like, people really love naming their children based off of what's popular, yes, like books. Yes, the amount of children named Daenerys right now. Oh my god, it's horrifying. But Scarlet, yeah, 
was Sorry. such a wreck as a human being. <laughs> Total mess. I still remember but, how messy she was. But this is a problem because, okay, the wreckness of her makes her a really interesting character. Oh, yeah. The wreckness of her also becomes an indictment of women qua women because there are so few interesting female characters in fiction who are that messy. Whereas you can have guys who are giant I mean, maybe it's because I'm not a woman TM, but I never really interpreted it as an indictment of women. I interpreted it as an indictment of the ignorant upper class. Okay, that's cool. So Be- Because it's like... Yeah, she's a woman, and so you can very easily, and people probably did at the time, well, very con- easily. conniving and manipulating. Exactly, and... just associate that with women. But really what it is, is the people, and it's people it's because ambition. there are plenty of men who did this back then, too. Sure. Who just sat on their ass. Yeah. After, no, post-war. She... Yeah, post-war. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like her base character mode yeah. was sitting on her ass, letting her literal slaves do all the work. Being pretty. And refusing to learn and grow and understand her place in the world and how her place is a significant position of power. Yes. And after the war, when everything goes to hell in a hand, she actually does what a lot of guys do, I think. I don't know. I've never read the book and I watched the miniseries when I was a baby. You were very small. It has, you know, people keep talking about it. So I listen to that. It almost feels like she does that thing that a lot of guys do nowadays where it's like weaponized ignorance. Or weaponized incompetence. Or at least she did at first before the war. I think that was before the war. After the war, she After is, the war, she shaped up for sure. But yeah, she was out there, you know, digging up roots Making and, dresses. And making dresses out of whatever she could. The costumes in the movie are almost enough for me to watch that miniseries again. But I know I'm going to be so bored. <laughs> I don't know if you would be. You'd be horrified. Well, I was horrified the first time. But the place where I'm going is this. Sorry. (laughs) It seems to me like there's a weird razor's edge that we walk nowadays with female characters when we look at them in historical texts. Yeah. That Milady is a fabulous... Yeah, love her. ...evil villain. But the fact that she's female, is this just misogyny? Or is this really good writing? Because... I don't get the sense that Dumas doesn't like women. I, I get the think, sense that Dumas likes women a lot. I think I'm, I mis- he certainly did in real life. Yeah, Dumas doesn't really strike me as a misogynist. That being said, of course, he was a man of his time. Exactly. So I'm so, sure I'm I'm sure his thoughts on like women voting or whatever is a little bit iffy. Maybe, but he's French. Yeah. So all bets are off. Well, the real question is: Okay, in the Count of Monte Cristo, yeah, how many really amazing female characters are there? Well, there's the lesbians, who I love. Okay, so... And then there is the... The champion, um, he's an ally. Oh my god, of course I can't remember her name, but she's the one who looks like a slave girl, like Uh, a harem girl, but she's not. She's his ward, because her father was killed by one of his bad guys, did bad things over, like, in Syria or somewhere. And so basically, he rescued her and has cared for her. Partially knowing that she is going to help him get revenge on one of his bad guys. Okay, cool. But she is spectacular. Dude. She has, like, ferocious scenes. Okay. So he but knows how to write love, women. The love interest uh, of uh. Edmond Dantes, he blames her for not waiting for him. Which sucks, because it's not really her fault. No, but it is completely... It makes sense that he would... That the character would be upset with that. That's a very human thing to do. No, you're right. That is true. In fact, I've blamed you for similar things. And actually, no, that's true because... does it? I don't know if that says, speaks to anything on Dumas other than he really knows how to write human. That's probably it. So, okay, so we're not unhappy knowing no. that Milady is really fabulous evil. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, it, she would have been written as a play off of the femme fatale trope. Yes. Of course, at the time, she was a little bit just the femme fatale trope. But that being said, I love the femme fatale trope, so I'm fine with it. We like Constance and Kitty. They're not idiots. Mm-hmm. Dickens, one of the best cat fights at the end Charles of a Charles Dickens? At one of the best cat fights at the end of a book. Shockingly. Oh, we're talking. End of Tale of Two Cities. Madame Defarge. 
Oh, and yeah. Lucy Manette's you... deaf nursemaid, like <laughs> governess, yeah. have if there had been mud on the floor, it would have been a mud wrestling match. It was an incredible fight. They're the ones that have the big fight at the end. So I love these that. guys are definitely writing strong, cool women. Dickens definitely did. If I, it's or... just the sexual politics in a French book that yeah. are at the time it would have been considered consent because. Kitty has she shown her him. interest and they flirted before. Yep. And that was enough for the time. Nowadays, we've evolved to a place where it's just like, no, you should always ask and you should always check in being like, are we still good? So to me, it seems like these, these books, the important thing, well, there are two so important things. Cool. One is it's important for us to see how far we've come. And to have an actual mirror Isn't that we can great? look into and be proud of ourselves about. Like, yeah. hey, we're getting better. We Yay. really are getting better in a lot we of are. ways. But the second thing is, The fact that a lot of people me, are not okay with some of the stuff that are in these books is sometimes a very good thing. I think so, too. I think we wouldn't know yeah. that we need to maintain this if we didn't have that. But I also think that, like, you go back to the Bible— the, what? The, the Old Testament is like people behaving badly. It's a it's a manual on how not to behave. Yeah. You know, one time these kids were making fun of a bald guy, and so they got like mauled by bears or wolves or something. That's a real thing that happened. I totally don't remember that from the Old Testament. Did you read all of the Old Testament? I read the entire Bible. Because how do you teach literature if you haven't read the entire Bible? I wouldn't read the Bible. It's that you can't understand most of literature written Without. by people who grew up learning to read by reading their Bible. You oh. can't understand literature if you don't understand your Bible. That actually makes sense, yeah. That's why I always had some kid in class every I year saying, why do you have church. a Bible in your class? That's and illegal. Like, I'm not teaching you the Bible. I'm teaching you to read. It's also, it's not illegal. It's a book. I'm sorry. No, I, this, I know. I know where he's this was from. during culture wars. In the no, 90s. we're still here. Oh, good. We're still there. Yay. I'm sorry. And anyone who's like, we can't do any religious anything for any holidays. I'm like, no, it's fine. Just do all of them. I loved H. It's like, no, if you want to celebrate Christmas. Christmas in the office, celebrate Christmas. Put out a menorah too. Just one. I don't really, we don't need that much. Just like a menorah. It's a small holiday. Have a Kwanzaa candle. You know, it's just like, make, cover your bases and let everyone celebrate. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm feeling better about this. I'm so happy for you after you ambushed me. I did. I mean, I did already agree to this. I did. I think... I did agree to this like a week ago, so it's fine. I think that the... Knowing that it's okay to not roll your eyes in a kind of a boys will be boys as much as a roll your eyes in a, oh, thank God we are not living yeah. like this anymore, that that's the important part. I've been trying so hard this whole time not to talk about the odyssey play i just saw because it go ahead and relates to talk this. about it okay so if anyone's in the philadelphia area like right now <laughs> at <laughs> upenn they're doing a show which is the odyssey told by four refugee women like at the refugee camp waiting for their numbers to be called so they can get on the bus and they can start moving and so they just they have nothing to do so they just pick up the book and they start reading, and only one of them knows the story, and it was like told to her by her father. And this was this version of the Odyssey yeah. was written and directed by Lisa Peterson, P E T E R S O N, like and, Jordan Peterson. No, <laughs> and based on Homer's The Odyssey, translated by Emily Wilson. So that's important. Yeah, it's the one where they call Odysseus a complicated man. Anyway, yes. I cried so much at the show. It was one of the best plays I've seen in so long. If any of you know the play She Fights Monsters, it's like that, but actually good. And basically, a lot of what happens is the Odyssey is filled with a bunch of people doing d and a bunch of misogyny. And so they constantly call it out every time it happens. They're like, why would he do that? Does nobody learn their lesson? What is happening? Why does nobody do anything correctly? And it's delightful. And it's honestly the way a lot of classic literature should be adapted. Because at this point, there are too many conversations we need to have 
in the middle of the literature, which is one why I think Craftlet is so awesome. Yeah. But this show works because they constantly have those conversations where it's like, hey, why is there only one male monster? Why are all the monsters women? Uh, the end result of that question is, we have no idea. It's probably misogyny. That being said, they are very fun characters to play. <laughs> so they'd like coagulate as a Scylla with all the legs and hands and they're going crazy. And they have a blast playing Cersei. And honestly, great. Great answer to the question, I think. It's like, he's he's bad. It's bad. Still a fun character. But being evil is fun to play. As all actors have said, yeah. It's really boring to play the goody goodies. Exactly. Anyway, that's not the point I was getting at. Okay. The point I was getting at is, especially with the misogyny aspect and the more assaulty moments in the Odyssey and the moment where after Odysseus gets home, spoiler alert. For a story that's been out for like uh, thousands of years, <laughs> it's been out a while. <laughs> it's been it's been a bit. When he gets home and kills all the suitors, he yeah. also kills all the slave girls, not servant girls. And they were slaves. They were. It was crazy. They were slaves. And it was stated clearly. Yeah. You said in the play that they were slaves. Yeah, they say they say slave girl first, and then they change it to servant girls, which I think was the right decision because it hit when. When yeah. she said that, but he does that. He kills all of his servant girls because they slept with the suitors because the suitors wanted to sleep with them and they literally can't say no. Was it that they, the suitors wanted to sleep with the girls or the suitors wanted to sleep with his wife and couldn't and so well, they, they went after the girls? It was probably that one. But one of the things, actually, that was also really awesome about this story is they ta- the director was like, the Odyssey is a perfect example of ancient Greece's beliefs on hospitality and how important it was. Mm, and how if you mess with hospitality, yeah. you've messed with a sacred... If you are one of those servant girls... Right. It would be inhospitable to deny them anything. Ew. And that would have been a sin. I'm I'm just thinking about that right now. But they call all of it out. And especially because it's like one of the girls in the show is I don't even think implied, but it's basically stated as like he wasn't she was human trafficked at one point. And one of the girls was in, is implied to have been a child soldier. And so it's like just with like Co- Co- Kobe? No. Who was the African child soldier? Uh, Comey. Sure, yeah. I'll take your word for it. Aaron had to study it, and it was very upsetting at the time. I might have studied it too, but I read so many books, you know. I'm just so literate. Talking about consent and how it looks in the modern day with a lot of classic literature not being super consenty. I think that show did did a perfect job of being like, yeah, no, it it was wrong. And And we know it. And Odysseus was bad for it, and it's like all these things, and it's like, oh yeah, and he was cheating on his wife for ten years with a goddess on a beach, yeah. and that's not okay. Yeah, that's actually like no and matter. And then gets what, mad at his wife when he gets home. Like, yeah, you were talking to these men, literally, and they call it out every single time because in, it is in the okay. play. Yes, because it isn't okay, and we need to talk about it. So the important thing isn't. And this is, I think, ultimately where I'm getting at. The important thing isn't to stop reading these books. Or change the text in your adaptation. Or change the text in your adaptation. The important thing. Like what they do in the Troy movie with Helen. Yes. No, Helen didn't have any agency, and that should be part of her character. You can make a really interesting character if she's aware that her agency is denied. So your dad, when he did his Agamemnon, his Cassandra was the most interesting i love cassandra yeah well she should be interesting she is an interesting character she is but helen of troy's never given that except i guess from this director who did a helen so it would be interesting to know how actually alexandre dumas would have written helen do you want to talk about the art that we're going to put up in the etsy store oh yeah i've finally become a corporate show i'm finally only making art for money i've embraced my capitalist side Uh uh-huh um, and so if you want to support me in my uh, corruption arc, <laughs> we're going to be posting a triptych I made 
of this little guy. His name is the Alchemist. Uh, he does not do alchemy, but his outfit is inspired by real life alchemical garments worn by alchemists, looking goofy as hell. He's really adorable. Yeah. Uh, if any of you have, if any of you have played or have kids that have played Hollow Knight, turns out they look very similar. Oops, on my part, wasn't aware of that when I drew him. I don't know if Hollow Knight came out yet. Maybe I was first, but anyway. So I made a triptych of him in like different places, doing different things, and then we also have a sticker. So far, yeah, I've made a sticker, and then maybe. There's also an owl knight I've created recently named Sir Pierce of Strauss, Knight's Knight of the Feather, that maybe... So adorable. Might, might be able to get a sticker there, too. Yeah. Anyway, basically, I'm going to start selling my art. Please buy it. <laughs> We're so poor. <laughs> it's so lonely in my mansion. <laughs> I need money so badly. I like your triptych, though. I don't want... I don't want to have a normal job. Please pay for my art. <laughs> I don't want to go back to Starbucks. Speaking. <laughs> so having a conversation with Aiden is a little bit like trying to hold a broken egg in your hand <laughs> and keep it all intact. But ultimately, I hope you found some at least thought-provoking things to come out of it. I continue to think about these issues and we will be talking about more of this stuff shortly i am sure i also apologize if you can hear any construction sounds our deck is being replaced by the landlord because andrew at the beginning of summer took the umbrella that goes in the middle of the table took it out, put it in place, and the umbrella went straight through the wood of the deck because it is old and soggy and rotten. It's a very shady area, and so it gets kind of mossy and <clears throat> softwood. So it's being replaced right now, and there was no way I could escape. It's going to take the whole week. It's a little deck. It shouldn't take all week, but there it is. So I apologize if you can hear banging and hammering. Uh, it's certainly not my first choice. But that being said, you take care of yourself. Have a great day. Please send in your comments to 063501642 or heather at craftlit.com or l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash craftlit channel get your thoughts to us any way you can. And if enough of you chime in, then we'll do a compilation episode of uh, comments, which we've done a couple times before. All right, you take care of yourself. Have a great one. I will talk to you soon. Oh, and for patrons, be on the lookout. We need books for this month's books party. So there should already be a post over on patreon.com slash craftlet where you can put your two cents in for what book we should be reading. Alrighty, thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. 